Uh, and a good morning, afternoon or evening to you, wherever you may be. Welcome to this, the fourth Tic Tech Civic Tech Surgery, organised by my society and supported by the National Endowment for Democracy, focusing today on storytelling and reach. How can we amplify our successes beyond the civic tech community to evidence our impact through mainstream channels? I'm Gavin Freegard, a freelance consultant working with my society on the Tic Tech Labs programme. Among other things, I'm also an associate at the Institute for Government Think Tank and a special advisor at the Open Data Institute here in the UK. I'm your chair, facilitator and host for today's event. Uh, do tell us who you are and why you're here in the chat, uh, if you like, and thank you to everyone who has done so already. Over the next couple of hours, we're going to discuss some of the challenges and dilemmas we face as a global civic tech community in making sure that people know about what we're doing, that people are aware of our successes, and that we're able to speak beyond our civic tech communities to mainstream channels and a wider public. For these first 10 minutes or so, I'm just going to outline how it can work and give you a bit more background to what we're hoping to achieve with Tic Tech Labs, of which this event is a part. Then we'll explore various questions about storytelling and reach with the help of some fantastic speakers and with all of you having the chance to share your thoughts as well. And then we'll think about what might help solve some of the challenges that we've surfaced. So some quick housekeeping first. Today's event is on the record, it's being recorded and will be published online after the event, along with minutes of today's event. You should be able to access a live transcript here on Zoom please let us know in the chat if you can't. You're very welcome to share details of the event on social media, hashtag TicTech. And if you'd like to contribute to today's discussion, and we hope you will, you can use the chat here on Zoom, and you can also use the Padlet board that you'll soon get a link to if you've not had it already. If you've not used Padlet before, you'll see it has the questions we're going to discuss, and then space for you to add your thoughts and comments by clicking on the plus signs underneath feel free to populate it throughout the event. There'll also be a few opportunities later to unmute your mic and tell us what you're thinking as well. Now for a very quick introduction to the Tic Tech Labs programme, which is run by my society with support from the National Endowment for Democracy. The aim is to discuss and tackle some of the biggest challenges facing the global civic tech and digital democracy sector. We want to grow the civic tech evidence base, address some key issues, and enhance the effectiveness and potential impact of civic tech projects. TICTEC, which stands for the Impact of Civic Technology Conference, started as an annual global in-person conference in 2015. We hope there'll be another in-person event in the future. In the meantime, we've converted it into the year-round TICTEC Labs programme, of which this event is a part. Our steering group, you can see them on the right-hand side of your screen, identified six big challenges common to civic tech around the world. You can see those challenges on the left. As well as today's subject, storytelling and reach, we've so far covered subjects including the accessibility of civic tech, and we'll move on to others, including using civic tech to tackle the climate crisis. For each of those six topics, we'll organise a civic tech surgery, like today's, to delve further into the challenges and possible solutions. After each surgery, there'll be an action lab or a small working group of around six people who will commission a piece of work to help solve some of the challenges raised. If you're interested in getting involved in that, we'll tell you how to do so at the end of today's event. By the end of the programme in 2023, we hope we'll have six pieces of commissioned work, as well as increased connections and learning across the global civic tech community. This is our fourth civic tech surgery. We've already commissioned some work on public-private partnerships from the first surgery. Our second action lab is discussing what to commission on accessibility at the moment, and we're currently looking through the applications to join our third action lab on accessing quality information. Take a look at the Tic Tech Labs website for more information on all of that. So today we're focusing on storytelling and reach, and particularly this big overarching question. What would help the global civic tech community to amplify their stories and successes beyond the civic tech community? So how can we tell everyone, mainstream channels, the wider public, about what we're doing in order to have the greatest impact possible? Underneath that big question, our objectives for today are going to be to discuss the challenges involved in all of that and understand what the biggest common challenges are when it comes to storytelling and reach, to share what we've all done to try to overcome some of those challenges, to discuss what else we've seen that has succeeded in amplifying civic tech projects through mainstream channels, and perhaps share some existing projects, evidence, research, et cetera, on the topic that might be beneficial. And last, but definitely not least, 
to explore how the Tech Tech Action Lab that will come together after this event can help address one of those common challenges by commissioning a relevant piece of work. And the way that we'll run at today's event, we'll take those first three questions, the challenges, what we've tried to do to overcome them, what we've seen others do to overcome them in order, hear some perspectives from our speakers, then give you some time for silent working to share your thoughts on the Padlet board and in the Zoom chat. And then for all of us to reflect on what people have been talking about, there may be a chance to unmute your microphone during that bit. We'll then move on to the final part uh, of the event, which is going to be suggesting possible ideas for work we could commission to help the global civic tech community overcome challenges in storytelling and reach. Again, we'll start with some silent working on the Padlet board and then get into discussion. And at the very end, I'll tell you how you can get involved in the Action Lab that will commission some work building on all of those ideas. You'd be glad to know that that's nearly it from me in terms of the introduction. Um, time to introduce our brilliant speakers who will share their experiences and kickstart our discussion today. They are going to be Daniel Carranza from Data Uruguay, Amy Leach from the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, Attila Juhas from K Monitor in Hungary, and our very own Nathaniel Nixon from My Society here in the UK. We're very grateful to all of them, as well as to all of you for joining us today. So hopefully that all makes sense. Uh, if you have any questions, pop them in the chat. I'm just gonna stop uh, sharing my screen at this point. Uh, although I don't seem to be able to, so I'll try and get rid of that in a second. Um, so hopefully if all that makes sense. If you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. Uh, if you've got any thoughts as we're going along, uh, share those in the chat or under the appropriate question on the Padlet board. So hopefully all of that made some sort of sense uh, and we can get going uh, into in going into the discussion properly. So the first question uh, that we're going to explore today is what challenges have you faced or are you facing when trying to amplify civic tech projects and their successes beyond the civic tech community? That relates to column one on our Padlet, if you've got that open. I'll ask each of our discussants to share their thoughts on the topic for around three minutes. Then we'll have five, uh, three minutes of silent working to add our ideas to the Padlet or to the chat. And then we'll have a little bit more time to reflect on everything that people have discussed and everything that's gone on the Padlet board. So I'm gonna hand over, uh, first of all, on the challenges to our first uh, discussant, and that's going to be Daniel, over to you. Okay, good, thanks. It's really nice to be here. Uh, thank you all for the invitation. Okay, so challenges. I. I believe the, the main thing that we, probably all of us suffer in the civic tech community is that we don't have like a single branding that we can go to. We are always doing new projects on different subjects on different topics with different partners. So I see the heads bobbing. So <laughs> I think this is important for all of us. Um, you're always reinventing your, your communications, your strategies and basically the wheel once and once and over again uh, with every project. This, this is obviously a huge challenge and it comes with associated challenges like, do I have different social media accounts for every project or do I use my own social media accounts? We learned this very fast back in 2012 with our very first project. Um, I think maybe two days into the, the making the second account for the project, we realized like, hey, this is going to be a problem. We can't have a single account for everything we do because we won't be able to control it. Um, so you not only you have this, this whole branding thing, but you also have to explain every time what is civic tech, what is open data, what is this collaboration within open government, so basically, I don't, I don't want to go into the how to address these challenges, but the problem is you are always a new version of yourself on every single project, and you have to adapt that version to uh, new audiences, new publics. Um, this also has a, a lot of, of um, contact with how much buy-in do your partners in different projects have with the, um, with the project itself, of course, but with the communications of the project. When, when you have a, a partner that will take care, for instance, of the communications, this is not such a big deal because it's something that you can kind of, you know, hand over. 
but in many cases you end up not only doing the the whole work but also having to care about communications that should be part of uh, your partner's uh, let's say worries too um and i think i'm not going to take too much time on that so let's start over there perfect uh, thank you daniel as i said i could see lots of uh heads nodding as you were going through some of those problems. Um, I suspect we may, may hear about uh, some of them uh, again. Um, we'll go to our next speaker now, and uh, that's Amy. Thanks so much. And likewise, I'm really, really excited to be here. And this is such a fantastic series of really practical, action-focused um, conversations. So the first challenge I'm reflecting on is that of communicating the impact of long-term systemic change. So I work for the Global Partnership uh, for Sustainable Development Data. Uh, we're a network of 600 organisations composed of governments, private sector, civil society, all united by the belief in the power of data to push and progress change. Um, and so a lot of our work is very systemic in nature. Uh, that means it takes a pretty long time. It's messy. It's iterative. Um, to give an example, we work a lot with um, governments on their strategies and approaches to data. Uh, for example, kind of we have long standing relationships with the governments of Ghana and Kenya. And I always think about this kind of systemic change like a spider web. There's so many different strands and actors involved. And so then often it doesn't feel very tangible. And I think often people are looking for impact packaged in these very kind of clear, nice narratives and stories. And that can be really difficult when you're talking about the kind of systemic lens. Zooming out a bit then, I think data and tech can be really challenging areas for constructive narrative building in mainstream spaces. And reflecting for a second on kind of, I guess, what I'm talking about in the context of mainstream spaces, here I'm talking about digital spaces like social media. Today that's obviously become increasingly polarised, driven by those algorithms, and so often the nature of online debate is much more polarized and stark than people's actual opinions. And I think also you see debate having to be kind of condensed into very kind of pithy, clickbaity nuggets and sound bites and so on. And that's really tough because it then removes the space for nuance. And so I think it's always interesting to reflect on some of the kind of defining social issues of our time. Climate is one. I used to work on migration, which is another that's come to define a lot of um, public narratives, often quite negatively. And there, both of those are obviously hugely complex issues, but there is the potential to boil down things into neat statements and pithy statements and so on. Whereas I think when it comes to data and tech, it's all encompassing in the modern day, but it is really messy and that nuance is essential. And so what we've seen is increasing focus on data harms and rightly on the anxieties around big tech and so on. But really that hasn't translated into a collective conversation about the urgency of the need for change and a more constructive dialogue about what a future looks like where data is used really fairly. And I think that is a major challenge for us all working in this space. And then finally, there's a challenge around stepping outside of the echo chamber and also your immediate constituencies. So we're a network, we have quite a global reach, but we're still constantly thinking about how we can connect with new pe kind of people, organisations and so on. And I think for kind of converting any of our work into those mainstream spaces, then really extending the reach on a mass scale is a big challenge. So I'll pause there, but I'm excited to hear more from others on this. Brilliant, thanks Amy. Um, let's go to Attila next. Thank you and hello everyone. It's, it's really great to be here. Um, yeah, when Daniel said that he sees people nodding, I think I was the one uh, because I, I can totally agree. So we are a very small NGO. Uh, our topic is, is mainly centered around the transparency of public money and entities and participation and citizen engagement. 
and we do we do a lot of things like we do research we do advocacy and and the technology is just a tool that that we use to to straighten our activities and uh, and it's just like six of us so i have five colleagues and and we are running two three projects at the same time so so one big challenge is the, is the capacity uh, that uh, that we we are neither a, a communication team not a, a software development team but we are a kind of civil organization and we try to to communicate with these 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 other people and and we do a lot of experimentation with the project what's gonna work what's not gonna work and and at the same time we, we strive for for perfection in our published material so it's it's a long 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 way until until we get to that point when when a project is is published so so at that moment we are just super tired and and it's just Oh, oh, and we still need to figure out how, how to communicate it and, and, and let's get together the, 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 the materials we get and, and, and find the target groups. So, so it's a lot of work and, 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 and we often lack the, the capacity to promote and, uh, and to build up uh, a communication plan in beforehand uh with, with properly defined target groups and detailed goals and and also to to write or or work on the on the communication material so that's one challenge that uh, that that it's somehow also part of the the core activity the communication but also it's just not not the main thing how we we want to do uh, or what what we are uh, doing, and um, shortly, I, I, I just or quickly, I, I just want to mention one other challenge is the is the maintenance that that for projects it's much easier at the beginning when you kickstart when you are enthusiastic about it and and you have a momentum and uh, and 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 media outlets are are curious about your work and. Uh, and and your audience is 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 also enthusiastic about it, and and also donors are are more willing to to give you funds. But when you are done with the project, then then you are there with the thing that you have to maintain. And uh, and after I don't know fifteen years of of work, you have lots of projects to maintain. And uh, and and that's a big question: how to reuse and how to how to further develop or upgrade previous projects. And I think these are the two, two main challenges I, I could think about. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, finally, for our opening speakers, Niv. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. And um, a lot of what I've just heard from the other three speakers, again, nodding my head a lot. Um, so I've been communications manager at my society for over 10 years now, and it feels like a lot of these problems, we never quite solve them. They keep coming round and we try different ways. Um, one issue that, that is repeated for us, I think, is that our work is quite often anchored in fairly complex structures. So we rarely have a simple story that the general public can just understand without a bit of background on, you know, what are our motivations? What is my society's theory of change? So, you know, for example, when we're writing about things that campaigners might have achieved through freedom of information, thanks to what do they know? We can't take for granted that the average person, the ordinary person in the street, would understand even what the Freedom of Information Act is or that it's available to them. So everything we write has to begin with a little explanation of that. Society specifically as well, we make open source software and the great hope is that people will go and pick it up and and install their own versions of that software and happily run websites that help people make freedom of information requests or report potholes to their councils and so on. Um, but in the nature of open source software, we don't always know who's using it or why. So we know there are great stories out there. 
really interesting human interest stories with the ways that people are using our software, often in ways that we hadn't anticipated ourselves, but we don't always know about them. Um, then we have a massive diversity of audiences, I think. We're talking to a real diverse set of people with different motivations, different levels of understanding, so it's hard to know exactly how to pitch those stories. Are you talking to the citizens that you hope are going to be using your so software or your services? Are you talking to the, the government? You know, we've set up these things. You can send your reports into government um, to your local council. Perhaps we have to make them understand exactly why we're doing that. And then at the same time, we're talking to funders to make sure that they understand why we're doing what we're doing and why they should grant us money to do it. Um, and then finally, and I think that this is pretty much what everybody was hinting at as well, it's a lack of resource. So, so many civic tech groups are just like my society. We started really small. And when I first took this job on, there weren't many people that were not developers. You know, the mainstay of the organisation were people who were making the product. That's the important stuff. We had never put resource into trying to talk to the outside world, whether that's the press or general public. Um, and, you know, from then on, there I was a single person trying to represent a, a spread of six or seven different services that we were offering and, and point it to all of the audience that I've mentioned. So, you know, one person is a social media manager, a commercial marketing manager, a press officer, copywriter, doing all the internet communications and internal stuff. Um, and you can do all of those things, you can keep them going, but what you ideally want is to do all of those things really well, and that's not always possible when it's just one person. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Liv, and thanks to all of our speakers for those uh, really helpful um, sort of introductory scene setters. Um, what we're going to do now is take three minutes. Uh, we'll have a timer on the screen very shortly. Three minutes to go to the Padlet board for everybody uh, to populate their thoughts on the challenges that you're facing uh, when it comes to storytelling and reach. Do feel free, uh, I'll post, post the link to the Padlet again. Um, do feel free to add things to the chat if you're unable to access the Padlet. Uh, and after those three minutes are done, um, I'll ask if any of our discussants have any quick reflections on other things that people have raised. Um, and again, if you'd really like to speak, do let us know and uh, we'll let you do so. So three minutes on the clock, uh, populate Padlet and uh, contribute to the chat. Off we go. And let's see what we've got on our Padlet. I think a lot of uh, common themes uh, from the Padlet and from what our speakers were saying as well. So we've got head versus heart. We believe in most of our projects, despite the facts about it, if uh, um, people are really demanding them. Time, um, somebody says they're a single person researcher. And um, when they use social media, they get an upturn in new users, but we don't have the time to be a comms person as well as researcher. There's, I think, going to be quite a lot about language, uh, harmonising the language and overlapping concepts. Uh, we've got strategic planning, so finding enough time and capacity for publishing something. We don't always talk to a diverse audience, it can be hard to reach. Um, challenges include that it's a wonky seeming subject without immediate impact at a time when protests and more dramatic action gets all the attention. Institutional structures not conducive to scaling up. Resource, resource, resource. We could always be doing so much more if we had more capacity. As a comms manager, the challenge is often persuading technical colleagues of just how much language needs to be simplified in public messaging, connecting the value um, of open data and source to use cases with significant societal, democratic and economic benefits, talking to a tangle of different audiences, it's difficult to know how to pitch the narrative, again, the range of stakeholders has come up from somebody else as well, getting interest from media outlets, um, to be interested in promoting open source projects, public not aware of issues such as algorithmic harm and how it might affect them individually, not always easy to track what people are doing with their, with your open source software, work is embedded in complex structures not always easy to communicate and the civic tech community can feel like a bubble uh, can be closed hence we often overlook the essence of simplifying our stories without speaking in jargon uh, we've also got maintaining a stable team has just come in as well um, because you can't pay market rates and resources again so resources and language um, are two of the big things sort of coming through there and um, I wonder if any of our discussants um, what's coming quickly reflecting on any of that or indeed if anyone else um, in the audience uh, has anything they'd like to add quickly to any of those thoughts. Daniel. Yeah, sure. Um, I think many of the, of the comments focus on talking about civic tech and the difficulties of talking about civic tech. 
And what we try to do basically is solve all the problem first and civic check later. I mean, we never communicate saying like, this is an open source solution for, this is a solution for, you know, done with open source, open data, whatever. Uh, I think that's absolutely a key issue. And eventually, you get people to understand that part. I don't know if this is your experience, Miff, Attila, Amy, but you know, like 10 years later, we now say open data and we don't have to explain like a whole paragraph about what that is. <laughs> <laughs> I still explain anyway, but yeah, I, it, time has a great effect, doesn't it? Attila, do you want to come in there? Yeah, I can relate to the to the resource part and uh, and with the strategic strategic planning, I think you can have a lot like like when you learn uh, to let things go and you to contain your your ability capabilities and and that helps you a lot because like you one thing everything is, is a nice ideal thing, but but you cannot do everything like you can you have to to cut things off and you had to to let things go and uh, and find the, the things you can really do your best in it and and that's that's a long way of learning how to do that but but that will help a lot right. excellent thanks and uh, amy do you have anything that you want to add to that Sure. I think, I mean, the, the head versus heart point really stood out in terms of framing. I think that's a huge challenge around civic tech and data. And it also really links back to what Daniel was saying about the entry point, because I think ultimately you need to bring it back to what connects with people on a more emotional level. You need to bring up some of these kind of big issues like big data and so on back to the everyday and what resonates with people. And I think done well, that's really effective. But in practice, as I'm sure we all grapple with, that can be really difficult to do. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I think I will move us on to the second question. As the second question for, for us to discuss is what, if anything, have you done to try and address some of these challenges? And I'll go in reverse order this time. So I'll go to Mib first, then Atiyah, then Amy, then Daniel. So Mib, over to you. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, so just reflecting on what we were just talking about, I think the temptation, oh, I've now got Oh, it's okay. It's just a thing saying the meeting will carry on. Um, yeah, just reflecting on what we were saying, I think the temptation is often to talk about it from the civic tech angle. So, you know, oh, we've got this amazing open source data rich tool. Those are not words that necessarily reflect with the average person. So when we're talking about quite complicated stories I always feel like I had a great benefit because when I joined my society I was coming from a totally unrelated sector and I had very little knowledge of what exactly you know what exactly civic tech was and what its aims were and I've never forgotten that a lot of our readers will be at that same starting point um, so I think you can do a lot with words it's often a bit of a drip feed it's often just stopping and putting yourself in your readers shoes and just, you know, imagine that you are trying to explain at a party or to a relative who has absolutely no idea what you do in your job and writing very simply, it's a skill and you can develop it. Um, so one of the things that I've done during my time here is develop a style guide that makes all of these points really clear. You know, hey, guys, you're a developer. I know you want to talk about the code behind this tool, but actually that will mean nothing to the people who just want to know how it's going to help them in their everyday life. Um, I talked a bit about keeping track of who has installed our open source software um, and how hard it can be to find the stories that we know are out there. And one way that my society has tackled this is through the creation of communities, just like TicTech. So TicTech is obviously one community where we find out a lot about what other people are doing, not just with our software, but all across the civic tech world. Um, we have, well, to a differing degree, with more success and less success, we have communities that are specific to our different code bases. So we've got Google Groups. Um, if somebody's asking us a question, how how can I install Fix My Street for my country? 
we try to point them towards the Google group because, hey, there's a whole load of people there who have been through the same issues. They've tried to install it themselves, come up with the same problems and some solutions. And then you can all sort of cross communicate and learn from one another. And when funds allow, we've been able to have conferences and that has been really gratifying and a great way of bringing people together. Alavatelicon brought together people who run freedom of information websites all around the world and my goodness you could not stop them from talking to each other and the conversation in the bar afterwards was of the sort that only freedom of information enthusiasts would have enjoyed but for those people you know it was so golden it was really valuable. Um, when I was talking about trying to talk to a number of different audiences, it's been interesting, actually, we've been more kind of systematic about this than ever before on our work with the Climate Action Plan. So really early on, in fact, I think as part of our funding bid, we sat down and we figured out who it was that we wanted to reach. Um, and this was all based on the kind of impact that we hoped that we would be able to make on carbon emissions at a local level. So, um, you know, we came up with a distinct audience of campaigners, people who are already very into climate and more likely to take action. Council staff were going to be key um, journalists to help us amplify, researchers to use the data. Um, and then finally, we wanted people all around the world in the normal My Society way to pick up the code, perhaps, or to get inspiration from our project. And once you have those audiences in mind, that is a starting point that's very easy to start thinking about how, what is your communications plan? How are you going to reach these people? And what words are you going to use? What are their motivations that will really get them using that stuff. Um, and then finally, on lack of resource, well, you know, it's a prioritisation thing, I think. So as I said, for years and years, my society's biggest focus was on getting the software right. And rightly so, you know, we couldn't be spending time and money on telling people about it um, at that point. But I think every organisation reaches a point where they realise that communications are a really important part of the puzzle. Um, and once you do that, and once you've got, you've been established a bit, you can work it into your funding bids as a line um, in every grant application. Um, we're also just beginning to look more seriously at what volunteers can do for us. Um, we're looking at what do they know, particularly, you know, could a volunteer be looking through recent freedom of information requests to see if there's a real good story there with real human interest and writing them up for us. And that is valuable for the volunteer and it's really valuable for us. Um, and then, you know, what, what about if we were encouraging our users to seek their own publicity as well? So whatever transaction they've just taken, you know, they've just submitted a freedom of information request or they've just um, made a report about a dreadful pothole in their local area that's bigger than anyone they've ever seen before. Could we be um, giving a little nudge that if it's worthy of a sort of local news story, um, here's some advice on how to contact the press. Yeah, so just a few ideas there. Excellent. Thanks, Smith. Uh, a great start to answering this question about what we've tried to do to address the challenges. Um, I'll go to Attila next. Thank you, I mean, I think you, you, you mentioned a lot of things and, and we have a lot to learn from you. Like, uh, like we, we all try to, 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 challenge, to answer these challenges, but, but yeah, as we are only five, six people, it's, it's just, can't afford to have a communication manager at this time and uh, and and to have proper uh, communication plans for every project as we have i don't know 10 15 projects in a year so that would take a lot of uh, our capacities so it's always like how how you can do it more more efficiently and and i think or uh, as i mentioned it's it's very important at the beginning to to find that that momentum uh but you but you will really focus on and and what you are not focusing on like for example we had um, a project called hotel oligarch it's um, it's to develop a map based website where we put um, 
in hotels and restaurants of politically exposed people. And at the beginning, it was like a lot of ideas all together, like what kind of database we should build and how to connect it to different other databases and, and very great ideas. But it was like just a fun project, but uh, like without any funding, just to work with, uh, with volunteer developers. And it was like, oh, come on, we cannot do this all. We, we have to curtail it down. And, uh, and at the end, we developed a very simple app with a very simple database. It looks nice. It's just a map with pins on it and, and the people loved it. So, so if you, if you can find a, a really good idea, uh, to develop, to work on it, uh, just do it and. And, and hope it's, it's, it's gonna work out. And like, if you, if you plan, like mm, the target audience, how they, what they accept, but just ask people as, as uh, that's another very important thing that, uh, as, uh, as a mm, group working for participation, it's, it's always important to, to ask people like how, how, how they, uh, what they want, what, what they expect from us. And, uh, and, and sometimes it's just very simple things, what, uh, what people could be happy for. And, um, another example for, um, for, uh, finding those, those, uh, small, um, subjects that people can, can relate to. Is, is another map-based uh, application from us. It's a, it's a childbirth experience map where, where the, the young moms could, uh, could review how, what kind of healthcare services they, they received from the hospital. And, uh, and that was a tool for, for collecting data of, of the healthcare system. And, uh, and that was like data-wise, not a smart move to put, uh, put a free text box at the end because it's, it's really difficult to, to analyze the data, what people just type there. But on the, on the other hand, and like in a communication way, it was really, really a good idea because like people could, could share their experiences. Like people, it made the, the whole portal personal and, and people loved it, people shared it. And, and that's why it, it went, went kind of viral. So, so that's another point to, to find or, or to, to try to, to localize that those, those topics or, or, or small subjects where uh, people feel the connection. Like it's, it's difficult to talk about transparency and corruption. It's always really difficult to find pe pictures for our materials because you can put money on the pictures and that's corruption. But, but you, it's, it's very difficult to make it visual. Um, but that's the important part where, where you can, where you, you explain people that it's their life. It's, it, it affects their life. And, and if you can, can find these, uh, these points in, in certain projects, uh, that, that will sell the project actually. Um, that will that will make it uh, useful for the people excellent thank you and um, we'll go to amy and then to daniel and then we'll have a bit of silent working again uh, but just a reminder that you can add things to the padlet or as miv is doing to the chat uh, as we go along as well so uh, amy over to you thanks and so many rich insights from miv and Attila already to build on um, someone mentioned on the Padlet the challenge of that tangle of different audiences. And I think something we've really found again and again is the power of working with and through your partners to extend your reach. And um, so one example of this is we're really proud to be part uh, of, the, of the Global Partnership, part of the Data Values Project. Um, which is a policy consultation and advocacy campaign really aimed at building that consensus around what a fair date to future could look like and then thinking very practically about the steps to move towards that. We're just over a year into that and there's constant lessons and constant uh, evolving and iterating as is always the way with these um, kind of campaigns. But 
activating our established community to then move beyond that through other partners has been absolutely central to success so far. Um, one thing that is really important to the Data Valleys project is young people and engaging young people, but traditionally the Global Partnerships Network hasn't focused that much on youth. And so we've been working with Restless Development, which is such a fantastic youth-focused organisation to really bring in that lens. And we've now got a youth-focused group who are a really important engine for thinking and ideas and so on that we're feeding in. But that's a constituency that is kind of far beyond our kind of usual reach and network. Um, second, which, you know, both Myth and Attila have touched upon, is moving beyond the kind of technical language of data and numbers to bring people into the frame. And that really brings these issues to life. Um, I think when used right, data and tech is essential in telling stories of the past and the present and the future and how might that future look. But really to do that, you have to kind of bring in that more human centered lens. Language can do that really effectively in trying to kind of boil down language. Myth spoke that a lot. And then Attila mentioned the importance of visuals and particularly on kind of tech focused areas. You have to make things visual. We share the challenges sometimes around the use of photos. And what we found works really effectively sometimes is then illustrations and animations. Um, so to give an example, um, we're currently working with various partners on a data science fellowship. And I think we'll all agree that data science is often seen as one of the driest and most technical areas. Um, but we've managed to tell the story of that project and the fellows involved in that project by working with a young Nigerian illustrator called MJ to really bring to life the fellows world. And it's been fantastic. And there's just these really colorful and fantastic images that have really injected uh, life into this and has been really effective. Um, and then finally, um, if you're kind of trying to do global engagement, which is at the center of our work, then uh, what's absolutely essential is being multilingual. And we're trying to really focus on doing this more and more. And I think what's essential there is that not being seen as a bolt on, but really absolutely fundamental to the design of any projects and campaigns. So thinking through, you know, dissemination strategies in different languages, um, thinking through kind of advocates, which can speak, uh, you know, different languages and all the resources being multilingual and so on. Um, a theme throughout this discussion obviously so far has been limits around resources. And so that is just a challenge, I think, because I think often we are all united in a belief that there needs to be more multilingual content, but very practically that can be a real challenge in terms of actually having the resourcing to make that happen. Um, thanks. Thanks, Amy. And uh, before we go to the silent working for three minutes, Daniel. Okay, so many uh, ideas to pick up. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's try to get this into three minutes. Uh, we, we have a, a slight advantage in our team because we are a small team, also like Attilas, but uh, two out of five have come from communications. So this is something that we really care about. And I think it has been a huge um, differential in our work through all those years. But the, this has led us to a conception of trying to streamline projects and communications both as much as possible. We basically design projects to be as easy to maintain and as easy to communicate as possible. This is something that makes a lot of difference. And for instance, we, we are very grateful users of My Society tools. And one of the things that we notice is that not all the, the administration of tools assumes you have people that are on those like 24 seven or you know, full time, whatever. Um, this is something that we learned that we had to change when we created our own tools. We, have to, to, we can't offer services that needs us to be present there the whole time. Um, so that has been our, you know, motto for, for development, especially. Um, and we try to also plan for updates and improvements in parallel with new partners or new funding opportunities. We, we, we realized somewhere along the way, we didn't plan for this, that every three years or so, we were motivated to find a new partner and have that as an excuse to update a project. 
you know, but we have to have like these sprints. We work on a project, Attila also talked about that. We work on a project, we focus on it for six months, a year, whatever. And then we can have a let it just be there, work on its own. We can keep giving it attention because we have other things to do. And maybe in a few years, we'll go back and improve it or whatever. And that's the way we found this like, I don't know, bipolar where we focus our attention on one side or the other. Uh, way of working has been the way that has worked for us. Um, this has also a lot to do with how we work with partners and Amy actually talked about this. We have to, in our case, partners are very invested in projects because we co-create projects with them. They care about what the project does, but they don't always have this buy-in um, throughout their organizations. So maybe they care a lot in a technical sense, but the communication people actually don't even know the project exists. That's a huge problem. And um, we also have to try to get this buy-in in the communities around projects. That that helps a lot with, with you know, uh, getting it out there, but it's also a challenge because many times when you engage with communities, and please let me be clear, you have to do that, they also expect from you all kinds of answers that you don't really have. I mean, we have to engage, for instance, with the environmental community through our app that deals with recycling, but we don't have the answers to the questions they ask us. We don't know, we, don't, we are not experts on sustainability or recycling. Um, in that case, for instance, our partner is, and that's the way we found to reach the communities and give a proper response. Going back to the point of entry, as Amy so eloquently put it, um, we came to the conclusion that we don't only not we not only don't have to necessarily start our conversations saying, "Well, this is open data, open source, or open government, or whatever," but somehow, even with, with some shame, I must say that we came to the conclusion that we that people don't really necessarily need to know about that. Our partners, yes. Government, yes. Decision makers, absolutely. But you know, the guy or girl or whatever that's using our tool, not, not really important. Uh, we, we just, we put all the information there on the website. Basically, we have this very thought out new uh, like footer that we created where you can really go deep and learn about absolutely everything related to open government, open data and our organization. But we are very, very aware that 95% of people won't even get there on the website. So that's something, you know, just we just let go and have to make peace with, I believe. Um, and with the audiences, something that also Attila and Myth uh, brought up before, you don't always have a clear audience, and that's a challenge. Uh, you know, uh, we work on health, recycling, uh, or freedom of information, none of those have clear audiences. Basically, everyone cares about those, those issues. So um, that's very hard. You can't always find, like, this is my target audience and this is the places where I can find them. Sometimes you, your actual target audience is everyone, which I know it's a sin in communications, but that's the truth. <laughs> um, and the funding for that, I, I think Myth brought a very important point. When you have to, you know, um, present projects for grants or whatever, most people won't dare to put communications into the budget. That's a huge, huge, huge problem. And I think that's a very systemic problem that we have brought up with many of our funders and we don't see a clear path to a solution right there. Um, maybe like, huge and very mature organizations like my society can actually present you know a 30 percent of our budget is for communications and someone on the other side might not like tell you to get the hell out of here but on our case at least especially working in latin america which involves you know very maybe a little bit of racism a little bit of other things but you don't get like significant budgets for communications um on visuals, uh, I just wanted to bring up a little problem that we had for, I think, 10, 15 years. We haven't even agreed on a logo or an image or an icon for open data. 
so yeah, we do have an issue with visuals. Uh, that, this has been like a, a nightmare of mine for the last 10 years. And this is a big problem to communicate those like contextual issues like open data, civic tech, uh, open software and stuff like that. And we are not helping ourselves not having this solved yet. And finally, with the multilingual thing, um, in cases like ours, where we work uh, with an audience with just one language, the biggest problem is that you have to take some of your resources and use them to translate or at least create materials about your project so you can reach a, a global audience. And that, that global audience is not users. It's just other people like you that we need to partner with and work with. But it's definitely like taking from a, a place where you need to invest resources to another place that it's also important, but doesn't get you results or impact. Brilliant. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and some great chats going on in the chat. I think we're, we're already heading towards some of the possible solutions uh, that we might be thinking about later. But what we're going to do for the next three minutes, uh, and we'll get the timer up very shortly, uh, for the next three minutes, uh, it's time for a bit of silent working. Use the chat, use the Padlet um, to put your answers to the question, what have you been trying to do to overcome some of the challenges that we've discussed? So three minutes, silent working, Padlet and the chat, and uh, go for it. So let's see what we've got on the Padlet. What, if anything, have you done to try and address these challenges? We've got motivate and stimulate. Oh, sorry, put that one across um, as I was speaking. Um, address the licensing of copyrighted commons materials, making a case for reuse. Collaborate with um, people who've done the same things. Put comms in as a budget line. That's something that we've been talking about a bit. Create partnerships with local media organisations. Promote through uh, community Facebook groups and other online groups. Um, think about your audiences before you launch or even before you start coding. Uh, open democratic organising work. This process is slow and takes much more time than quick win projects. Create communities, including online spaces where people can chat together and share stories. Promoting a local open source project by the Digital Public Goods Registry. Keep language simple. Goes back to a point we've made quite a lot already today. Um, you've got to consider comms to be an essential, as, as essential as any other part of the project, not an add-on that you consider after launch. And motivate, stimulate users of your data and platform to promote or explain their work um, in their work how they've used a tool or open data set. It's so got lots of really good constructive um, solutions to some of those challenges. Um, I don't know. Do any of our speakers want to add anything quickly Attila, yes and then yeah just a quick uh, comment on keep, keep the language simple that that's a very very simple idea i really like it that uh, if we are about to develop a project i i always tell about it to my mom and and if she can understand if she she can relate to it then then it can go through so that that's a good test for for how simple the language or the the idea is and i just wanted to to comment on another the to put the comms in a in in as a budget uh the main problem I think for us is that we don't have a, a communication officer or co communication manager. So this task is, is just sorted out in between us. Like I also do some communication. I do the mailchimp and I write blog posts, but there's another guy who, who's better in it. Uh, but there's no, no dedicated person. Um, and I think we cannot afford at this point. So it's, it's really difficult, even if we have a budget, uh, to, to find the, the place or, or to find the, the proper person who's, who's actually gonna take care of, of, of the communication and, uh, and who's not totally a UFO from, from another organization or from another company. So that's, that's the main challenge for us. Excellent, thanks. Uh, Amy, then Liv. This has already kind of been a theme of the discussion, but something I was struck by is the comms not as a bolt on. I'm sure we all really grapple with that and kind of working with others on that. And I think that and the kind of budget line and so on just speak to the point of, you know, it's sometimes as much about that kind of internal advocacy and building buy-in within your organization, or, you know, Daniel spoke to kind of building buy-in with kind of partners or those communities, 
to then build the foundations to let you scale and do all the work externally. And that takes time and energy. And I think something I've seen in lots of different contexts is kind of actually not a recognition of the importance of that and giving people the bandwidth um, to do that. I think, because again, a kind of core theme here is challenges around resources. And I think that, you know, that is a big challenge, not one that's overcome easily, but collaboration and crowdsourcing and sharing of resources and knowledge, I think is just so fantastic. Like even on this session today, we've already had people share kind of image libraries and so on. I think something I found time and time again, there's, for example, I don't know, some of you might be part of the kind of digital Slack charities, kind of Slack space uh, in the UK. There's always being resources shared there. So I think the more we can do, and obviously kind of my site in this session is already fantastic to build those structures to enable crowdsourcing ideas and sharing of resources, the better, because that is just really beneficial for everyone. Thanks, Amy. Yeah. Yeah, just listening to Attila speak, it reminds me very much of my society's much earlier days. I feel like it's a teething problem that every organization goes through where your ambitions exceed your capacity um, and one thing I put in the chat actually was the one really hard thing my society had to do a few years back was look at the vast spread of all of our different projects and just think no we've got to close some of these down because we just haven't got the capacity to be not only talking about all of them but you know, monitoring all of them, making sure that the code's up to date, making sure that all the bugs are squashed and all the rest of it. Um, but actually, going back to what Amy was saying, yeah, there are some sort of self, um, you know, things that just keep the momentum going on their own, which I think civic tech organisations are quite good at thinking through. So, for example, when you complete an action on one of our services, it will quite often flag up another service so you've written to your mp maybe at the end of that it says well well done doing that now are there any problems in your local area that you want to report to your council or are you having problems getting this pothole, pothole filled perhaps you'd like to put in a freedom of information request to find out more about the background there so those things don't cost very much um but they do have a bit of a an impact Brilliant, thank you. And Daniel. Yeah, actually, Matthew just made me remember. We this this future I was talking about where we also have this information about open source and open data and open government. The main reason that we started working on that is that we realized that none of our projects mentioned the other projects. So we had all this cutting audience and we were just letting it go. And it has a lot of information, but the main thing, the main reason that we made it is because we have the little logos of every other single project that we have. And from that, we can get at least some traffic or some recognition. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, we're now gonna move on to our third question of the session, which is what have been successful ways you've seen to get civic tech successes and projects into mainstream challenge, uh, channels? I suppose as well, any useful resources, research, et cetera, that you've seen. Um, so what others have done that you thought was really rather good in terms of getting civic tech into mainstream channels. Um, and this time I'll go in the order, Amy, then Daniel, then me, then Matilla. So Amy, let's start with you this time. So two very different examples. Um, the first kind of builds on that point of really the power of building in engagement and communications as a core pillar of the strategic kind of outreach from the very start. So we worked with Welcome and uh, an organization called African Voices on a project tackling antimicrobial resistance in Kenya, um, which is kind of one of the biggest public health challenges. Um, but there's a real kind of lack of understanding and awareness around it. It's one of the less tangible public health issues. And so this project worked um, around an SMS campaign and a campaign with local radio stations in three counties to really try and drive more of a public conversation around what AMR looked like day to day, what could be done and what kind of uh, in your everyday life you could be doing to play a role in kind of tackling it. 
And the purpose of that was twofold. So first, it was that point around building knowledge and awareness and more of a conversation. Uh, but there was also an exercise around data collection, because this project was all about generating and using citizen generated data as a complementary data set alongside official data, which when it comes to AMR is pretty patchy. Um, and it was incredibly effective, and I think for a number of reasons. So there was a really strong focus on bringing the kind of human dimension into it. So on a lot of radio shows, you'd have people, vets, there was a mum with her baby, just speaking very practically to how that kind of had looked in the context of their day-to-day -day lives. Um, there was also widespread engagement across at the kind of county level. Um, with doctors and nurses and practitioners, and that was really, really essential. Um, and then um, there was really tailoring it in different contexts. So all of these radio shows and SMS campaigns were conducted in local dialects. And the project saw kind of a lot of buy-in from government, it saw policy shifts. But I think, yeah, from the very beginning, a really there was real clarity around audiences. Um, rather than talking about data, this is something that kind of Daniel spoken to, they were talking about the public health issues. So data was not the entry point, even though actually it was a data collection exercise. Um, so I think that's a really interesting example. And then the other example, which is very different and not related to the work that we do, is around censuses. Because I was thinking about, OK, what is kind of data tech stuff that is really in the mainstream. And in most countries, you have the census as a kind of pillar that most people are aware of. It happens relatively kind of regularly, that drumbeat of the census. Um, and people understand it as that kind of information gathering exercise. But how do you use the census to drive that broader conversation around data as a core tool to understand our societies and our present and our future? And I think in the UK, the 2021 census did that fantastically. And uh, the UK Office for National Statistics did some really incredible campaign work around that. Um, but one thing really stood out to me, and that was the work of the uh, historian, uh, Professor David Olashoga, and his work really talking about the history of the UK and the census and its role. And there's tons of amazing stuff he did, so I recommend a Google. But one particular exciting thing to me uh, was some really interesting work around data literacy in the context of school kids. So he ran an interactive lesson to over one and a half million school kids, I think it was, on um, representation, equality, and the census um, that really walked through how the census fitted into national identity, how the questions have changed, and so on. And that to me was really inspiring in building a different conversation around the role of the census in our societies. And then also just a really interesting case study in how you build data literacy and with young people, which is so essential. Um, so yeah, that's two examples from me. Fantastic, thanks Amy. I'm going to be checking some of those out after this event. Um, let's go to uh, Daniel next. Okay, so um, the, the first thing I, I, I believe is partner buy-in. If you don't have partner buy-in, you are really <laughs> in deep trouble, basically. And the 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 best example that we have at the very least, but it's, it's an interesting one, is that what we have achieved to do with uh, Donde Reciclo, which means where do I recycle, which is a wrap for recycling, as you might imagine. Um, our partner is um, an NGO that comes from the like a, a chamber a chamber of industry. So they have deep connections with industry. And what we do is of interest to many big producers of you know consumer products because they have this law that makes them responsible for the waste they produce so through that we found a way for them to have a direct interest in our project and that allowed us to sort of hack our way into their own communications they we allow them to become partners of the app not only you know, supporting and like paying for the logo to be in the app, but giving them incentives to use the logo of the app in their own communications. So 
miraculously, our little lab ended up on TV, um, you know, um, radio, and you know, um, outdoors and everywhere. I I'm talking like a hundred, hundreds of thousands of dollars of advertising with our logo over there that we could have never paid for. Um, then you have other stakeholders buy in. We have this other project at tu servicio or at your service, which deals with health service providers indicators, like key performance indicators. And this was by chance, not by strategy, but since the project had a lot of traction, the health service providers ended up caring a lot about how they were seen there. And they ended up doing, in this one case, advertising that they were ranked first in the satisfaction index or whatever that we showed. So they ended up using us as part of their communications materials. Then you have press buy-in. Um, and this was brought up in the Padlet. I do agree that you need to create these long-term relationships with press. You end up being a source. Uh, at least for us, we know that, uh, you know, press releases, like good old press releases, are uh, the easiest way to get free minutes, <laughs> free communications, because many journalists just find it a very nice and easy way to have an article without a lot of work. So you do the work and they publish the article basically. But you also need to, uh, to manage expectations. We have these partnerships, uh, we had these partnerships like for long term, especially trying to um, push uh, data journalism. And we ended up doing a lot of free work <laughs> because they didn't have the capacity and they ended up like using us, not in that such a bad, sense uh, as an external and free provider of data visualizations and stuff like that. Um, and finally, on storytelling, it's, it's one of those terms that it's, you know, a buzzword and everybody's talking about storytelling and it is important. I don't want to challenge that. But what I see with a lot of, you know, online courses about storytelling and capacity building seminars and whatever is that everybody's focusing on one kind of storytelling that's basically, you know, a watered down version of a TED talk. Like I have, this was the problem and this is my personal story and why do I care and how I solved it and how the world is better because I did this. And that works of course, but that can't be the only way to tell stories. Like, please, <laughs> this is more of me begging everyone than any other thing. Um, the, there are many other ways of telling stories and they are relevant. Personal stories are not relevant in this sort of thing. I have been asked, for instance, to make stories about our projects personal. And I mean, I'm not, you know, recyclable waste. So I can't talk to you in a personal sense about that. And people shouldn't care who I am. If they shouldn't care of what open data is, much less they should care of who I am or why I'm doing this. Uh, so, Storytelling, yes, but which one? Excellent, really interesting. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Miv, let's go to you next. Thank you. I've, I've just remembered actually a, a couple of times Fix My Street has appeared unexpectedly on primetime TV, like somebody's just mentioned it, um, whereupon many, many more people than we would expect suddenly flood onto the website and um, you know, thanks to our developers, it does seem to withstand that sort of influx, but often goes a lot slower. So um, I suppose a bit of a warning to be prepared for when, when one of your one of your comms uh, forays is actually successful <laughs> against all expectations. Um, so I hope you don't mind, but um, in a very comms manager sort of way, I've actually prepared some slides. So do you mind if I share some visuals? If I... Yeah, why? Is it giving you the option to share? Yes, it does. Yeah. Uh, so if I just do that and then that, can everybody see? Yes. Great. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I've just got a few examples. 
Um, this was a fairly recent one. We worked together with Climate Emergency UK, another organisation, to gather together all of these climate action plans of all of the local councils. And then Climate Emergency UK themselves put in an absolutely colossal amount of effort going through all the different councils action plans and scoring them. So at the end of this project, they had this huge amount of data, which they just knew was going to be a great exclusive for a newspaper. Um, and in that case, it was strong enough. It was a strong enough story that, hey, we are going to put out this data that basically says which councils have done really well and have a good plan in place and which ones are lacking that they actually just rang up The Guardian, which is our national sort of left leaning newspaper, um, spoke to a journalist and secured an exclusive. So that went out before the story hit anywhere else. Um, it was on The Guardian front page for some hours, actually. It was like the most, one of the most viewed stories. And then after that, it was on like the climate front page for a few days. So that's one of the most successful recent attempts that I've seen. Um, the other thing on the back of that, again, it was man hours, like putting in the time, and we helped out with this at my society as well, um, emailing every regional newspaper in the country with a dedicated, um, you know, this is what your council has scored in the scorecard. So it had to be tailored to each each region one by one. But of course, once you've written the email, you just need to be copying and pasting the data in each time. And that's quite a My Society way of doing things. We quite often do things that take a long time, but don't take lots of money. So uh, for good or ill, that's how we often approach things. Um, this is one that we wrote about on our blog quite recently. So Transparencia in Belgium, that's an Alavatelli site running a freedom of information website. They're quite proactive at just poking the authorities with pointed sticks. Um, and in this case, this was about a piece of legislation that was asking councils to pre-publish agendas of council meetings so that citizens could see what was about to be discussed. Um, so the legislation was sort of pending. I think it's just gone through just in the last week. But in the time before it was going through, some councils were getting ready, some were doing very well. And you can see here the green patches were the councils who were already publishing this data. Yellow were the ones I think perhaps they were intending to or they were part way there. And the red ones were the ones that um, that hadn't done anything at all. And Transparencia, we've written it all up on our blog, Transparencia said that every time they published this data out, it was the number one topic of conversation in councils because no council wanted to be shown up as one of the red areas. Um, and how they achieved this sort of coverage, again, they got it in two quite major newspapers, was to pair up with journalists and teach those journalists how to use freedom of information requests in bulk right across the country. So to put in a request to every council across the area and ask them, how far along are you towards adhering to this legislation? Um, and then, of course, a bit of coding and data munging to actually get it into a nice map. But a really clever bit of, um, you know, like, what's that saying about teach a man to fish? So teach a journalist to use a freedom of information request. Um, and then they have a bit of ownership over that data and it's more likely to get into the papers. Um, oh, this is a nice one that we benefited from a couple of weeks ago. So I don't know whether everybody around the world is as keyed in as we are to the fact that Boris Johnson, our prime minister, had a party during lockdown. This is a real political hot potato in the UK and it has not um, dampened down over several weeks. Um, what we noticed was that on our website, Write to Them, which allows citizens to contact their MPs, there was a massive upturn in numbers. So obviously we can't look at what people are writing to their MPs. We don't know what the content is, but we can very much say, well, you know, on the day that this story hit the front page of all the newspapers, whoa, like numbers went up. And we're pretty sure people were writing to their MPs 
to express their feelings about Boris Johnson having had a, a birthday cake and a little party. Um, so that was a good one and that got picked up. All we did was put out a tweet. We didn't actually contact any journalists, um, but it did get picked up and the story, the tweet was the story. So, you know, you can't ask for more than that. That's nice, easy work for a comms manager. Um, this one is from the Czech Alavatelli site. Um, they were lucky enough to win a competition that gave them some free billboard space. And I'm always talking about getting billboards and obviously it, that is a funding issue and my society has never been in a position to purchase out of home space like that. So this was really interesting for me to learn about, um, like what would you do with that space if you had it? Um, and what they did was, I think this says something like, according to like 106 is, that must be their, their FOI act. Uh, according to 106, I have the right to ask. And then a number of posters would come up with ideas for things that you might like to ask. And I think this one says, um, who picked the companies that imported face masks from China? So this was a COVID related thing that just sort of normalizes the concept of using freedom of information to find out the things that you might be wondering about every day. Um, and then finally, um, I love this organization. They're not an Alavatelli um, site, but they are a freedom of information site. Good friends of my society's Frank Den Start. They are so cheeky and they're not afraid to go into opposition with government, with authorities, um, to go to court. They often crowdfund for the fees that they need to take people to court. Um, and in this case, they had published uh, the cancer risks of, um, how do you pronounce it, glyphosate. So the fertilizer that has, um, you know, a number of different risks attached to it. Um, and that has gone all the way to court and Frag Den Start have won their case that it was lawful to publish. Um, so, you know, one way of getting stories out there perhaps is to just be reckless and naughty and uh, take people on. Yeah, I'll stop sharing now. There. Brilliant. Thanks for fantastic examples there. Um, Attila. Thank you. I think you already mentioned a lot of great things, but what you what what can be useful for for getting into the mainstream media. Uh, I really like the idea. Use the like I think all all or most of these are are centered around creativity, like how how to how to replace uh, the lack of capacity with with creativity. Like you have to be creative because you like. In Hungary, the, the the state media channel has like a yearly budget of 250 billion euros. Like you, you cannot compete with that. Like you cannot compete with the with the with the main media channels. So you have to be creative. And and I really like the idea to use billboards. And I remember when when we we wanted to buy places from from the Budapest. Uh, transport company uh, to advertise um, a cell phone app uh, for uh, for our corruption database like that's that's also a map based application where, where people look for um, what kind of uh, corruption related news uh, located around them and uh, and actually they refused to sell our, to us uh, places because they said it's against their business policy as there was a corruption scandal of the of the transportation company on the on the map so we tried to use but yeah so basically it, it's it's just creativity and um, and i really like that we talked a lot about media uh, because that was the point that I wanted to, to say at this uh, question to use the media as a tool and not just a tool but as a partner like uh, um, like here in our 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 country or in in our society or our field of of, of work like um, like in mainly in Budapest like also the 
the main uh, news channels of, of the country are, are located in the capital and, and it's not a big metropolis. So, so basically, you know those people who, who you work with or, or who are um, writing the news and, um, and, and, and to maintain a good, good relationship with them, like also personal, like I, I used to uh, go to the same university as, as some of the journalists now. So, so it's 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 very very effective to use this this kind of relationship. Like sometimes I, I ping them even before we publish uh, a material, or or even before uh, I I send out press releases to let them prepare. And 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 they are really grateful, as as Daniel mentioned. Uh, that that somebody is doing actually their job writing articles and and they are happy to to publish these these materials most of the time and um so yeah basically these these personal channels or personal relationships can can help a lot um yeah an example for uh, for for one of our campaigns um, I already mentioned the the healthcare uh, childbirth data data mapping tool. Uh, so at the beginning, we ran a campaign. We reached some fifteen thousand reviews, which is quite good for us, and and we were happy with that. But then later on, like one year after, we wanted to run another campaign to have new data, like what happened in the in the in the maternity care to see what happened in the maternity care in the last year and and as i mentioned it's always uh, a challenge to to rerun a campaign or or to to have the same topic uh dropped in for for the second time and and we prepared uh different um, different media materials like we 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 did a video report with one of the um uh, one of the media outlets on the topic. Also, also we had an article, a series of articles in another mainstream media. So to just to combine and 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 yeah, like combining the different uh, media media surfaces and being creative and 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 yeah, that was already mentioned before at the last question to to make it personal. Um, that's another thing. Excellent. Thank you very much. So we're going to put three minutes on the timer uh, to give everyone uh, three minutes of silent working on the Padlet. And in the chat, it's column three on the Padlet. What have been successful ways you've seen to get civic tech successes or projects into mainstream channels? Any useful resources, research and examples? We've had some brilliant examples already. Um, please do go to the Padlet uh, and put in the chat uh, now. You have three minutes. Uh, we'll quickly begin any moment now. Let's see what we've got on the Padlet. We've got um, we've got the glyphosate report. Um, doing something about a current issue, but optimizing a civic tech value to that story that others can't do. Join a media outlet as a partner into your project. Never waste a good crisis connected to your work. Um, we've got the digital charities uh, Slack community. Uh, we've got the letters to MPs. Uh, from my society, partnerships with local journalists, influencers and activists, using not only national but local and regional outlets, funding from a funder who is willing to take a chance on a project different from other projects, transparency, and the climate scorecards in the Guardian. So lots of excellent examples there. So thank you very much everyone um, for answering all the questions we put to you so far. We've had a really brilliant discussion. We've thought about what the challenges are, we've heard about how people have tried to overcome them and we've had some other wonderful um, examples of sort of successful attempts to get civic tech projects into mainstream channels. Uh, in the remaining time we're going to start thinking really practically about solutions to some of the problems that we have covered. So as I said earlier, the Action Lab or working group that will come together after today's civic tech surgery will have up to $3,760 US dollars available to commission a project that aims to solve one or some of the problems that we highlighted today. So in the remaining time, the question we're going to think about is what sort of things might help to address the common challenges discussed so far? Because we are going to start thinking about specific projects that we can commission uh, that the Action Lab will consider. 
So what sort of things might help to address the common challenges we've discussed so far? Again, we're going to start with five minutes of silent working, so you can add ideas to the Padlet board. Uh, I think it's going to be the fourth column of that. Um, you can also add things to the chat. Um, and then we'll have some time to see what our discussants think of those ideas. And again, if anybody else uh, wants to say something in that time for reflection, please do say in the chat or raise your hand using the tool uh, on the reactions button. So five minutes for some silent working. I think the timer will start any moment now. Things people have suggested include uh, promoting a civic commons framework. So repurpose creative commons, um, which would allow um, sort of uh, things to be licensed within that framework and highlight exceptions. Uh, partner with a media platform to show how civic tech could be applied to benefit its own work. Develop a canvas for effective civic tech commons, including concrete examples and successful stories. Media training for civic tech comms folk uh, to get people outside the bubble. A prize for a newsroom who can use data from one of the included organisations to craft a story. Uh, can actually use uh, the money that we have uh, to give a prize. Uh, a civic Tech Media Fellowship for Local Journalists, so aimed at lo training local journalists on best ways to report the impact of civic tech project in local news outlets. Collate Civic Tech um, Visual Explainers, so sort of signposting or a, or a resource on something that explains what open source, open data, creative funds, etc. are. Um, a journalist and civic tech conference that could bring journalists and civic tech people together, or just a bursary allowing civic tech people to go to journalism conferences as speakers. Uh, this one came up earlier as well. Pay a photographer to photograph some of our many abstract needs as an open source photo library. Uh, a local press uh, fellowship, building on uh, an example uh, from data for SDGs. Uh, a civic tech storytelling competition, again, somebody's uh, using policy, uh, who've done a speculative fiction competition as an example. And a portal that published case studies from a load of civic tech organisations in one place. So journalists could subscribe to and easily ask for more details. It would be a resource for journalists. Some excellent ideas in there. Um, again, if anyone uh, in the audience uh, has any reflections on any of that, please do um, put your hand up or put your uh, idea in the chat. Um, otherwise, we'll hear from our discussants. So let's go to Daniel first. Okay, so I, I believe the, the big overarching issue is basically uh, shared resources versus capacity building and strategic planning. Um, I think the focus, and you can see it in the responses we, we have in the Padlet, the focus is mostly put on how we build capacity and how we teach organizations to be more strategic and more effective and whatever. And besides the fact that I hate canvases, I hate <laughs> filling them in, <laughs> how many times you can learn something where you actually gain something from it? I mean, every time we get a big fund, they make us go through this process of strategic planning and whatever. And that's, that's okay. I mean, it, they're in their whole right and they care about the project, the products and the projects, but it gets to a point where you are just basically wasting most of the time you're doing that, that sort of thing. I think those resources should go to creating common resources, common shared resources for the whole world to use that persist in time. To put a few examples on this, um, we centrally, I think we should have something to help us out with the most technical part of communication, which is not like thinking campaigns or strategic thinking, but uh, advertising like crude, full advertising, pauta uh, we would say in Spanish, like buying advertising. A central online marketing hub, if you wish, somebody that can negotiate prices and do bulk buys for Facebook ads and Twitter ads and whatever. Uh, we use mostly digital resources for, for communications and we are paying extremely ridiculous prices for something that could be negotiated much cheaply if we all are buying together. Something like that could be actually financed through small commissions in the, the, the advertising everybody else is buying. So it's actually really easy to maintain. And I think, I think this is the sort of challenge that one funding organization could take on and really help us all a lot. We don't have the knowledge to for online advertising and we don't have the specific knowledge of, you know, tracking campaigns and clicks and conversions and stuff like that. That's very complicated. 
believe me, I tried to learn it. I, I couldn't. <laughs> so that that's the sort of thing, you know, the image bank that we were talking a while ago. We could even have, you know, a common matrix server. I don't know if anybody else is running away from Slack and going to matrix or element right now, <laughs> but uh, having a shared space wouldn't only be like a good policy, you know, on privacy and encryption and whatever, but it will also be a place where it's much easier to have exchanges between us and create specific groups and work on projects and stuff like that. We have like a million Slack servers or whatever around the world and everybody's saying like, join my Slack server. I, I don't think that's the way we should go forward. Um, yeah, well, that's basically it. Yeah, I mean, there are other examples of things that we all need and we could share, but I think you all get it. Fantastic. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, we've got just under 10 minutes left. Uh, Amy, you're next. I mean, what an incredible set of suggestions and ideas, and it's just so energizing and exciting to read through them all. Um, building on what Daniel was saying, as he says, there's this kind of common theme around knowledge sharing and kind of upskilling and so on. So I think alongside a kind of shared space, whether that be with images or like templates and so on, uh, an accompanying thing there that could be so useful is a series of kind of comms workshops on some, there's been some kind of common threads here, right? Media engagement, digital skills and tools and so on. So perhaps a series of uh, workshops geared towards anyone working on these issues, because obviously a lot of smaller organizations might not have comms people or teams, but that really has a civic tech lens. Um, because I think even in this session today, there is just so much expertise and ideas that's coming through uh, that can be built upon. Um, and then just the other thing that I think really came through is how do you kind of crowdsource creative ideas and inspiration? And I really love that idea of, um, you know, a storytelling competition or something similar. Um, I thought that was great. Brilliant. Thanks, Amy. Um, Attila. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I think this, this all that you said, it, it's around uh, like experience sharing and, and learning from each other. And I really think that this is very important. Like, like this is the way how, how we can, how we can uh, go after the, the mainstream media or, or even, even in front of the mainstream media or how we can get our issues into the, into the media and reach broader audience. So, so, this is a really a hard question. Like, <laughs> I, I was thinking a lot about about this issue because one one sum of uh, of of money just just won't solve all these problems. So, the main challenge or the main problem for us, like in general, for for our organization, like how how to. Uh, be how to to keep keep a stable budget for not just for the next year but for the next ten years. So to find those points where where you can find the um, reliable resource for for longer time and and I would go into this direction in this this communication knowledge sharing. Uh, field as well to build something which lasts for 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 longer time like either it can be uh, a common website or a website with with common information of useful tricks and tips or 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 relationship between like personal relationship between between organizations or uh, or people who work in organizations so so I would mention here, like I really like conferences as well, like those kind of conferences where where you can really share your 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 experiences, your negative thoughts, your your positive uh, energies, and and I feel like a bit like that now, as as I heard about your stories too. So it was really nice to 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 feel that. Uh, that point that there's something very similar struggle in, in Uruguay, for example, as, as we have here. So these like enthusiastic, like, like emotional um, 
sort of things are are helping a lot to 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 keep us in 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 the challenge and and yeah so i know it's it's not a very concrete answer but something <laughs> excellent thank you very much and uh, finally miv yeah i completely agree with what attila was saying and also daniel that it's a tricky sum of money to do something that is going to have a long term impact because yes you can skill up today's civic tech groups but then five ten years down the line will that all have completely disappeared obviously creation of something like a wiki or a website like attila said youtube videos but you know things keep moving when you think how much social media has changed and the way that you can advertise on google or facebook has changed just in the last couple of years so i fear that that sort of knowledge is going to be very quickly lost um, one thing I do really like is this idea of a prize for journalists for a number of reasons, um, partly because every journalist loves a prize, you know, how nice to get an award, um, very tempting then to dig in and find out a little bit more, but also because then they are publishing stories that presumably would have this little logo of the prize on it, might encourage people to click back and find out more about it, so it's sort of virtuous circle and a win-win. A um, then finally, just this idea of a photo library that came up in chat in real time during this meeting um, answers a need that was expressed by a number of different people. So I, yeah, again, that's something that might have a nice long lasting effect if we could get enough photographs that clearly help explain the sorts of projects that civic tech organizations are always struggling to find something nice and graphic. Fantastic, thank you very much. And Amy, do you want to come back in there? Yeah, just to add very quickly, because as you say, this photo library has, I think, captured the imagination of this uh, group. Alongside that, what could be really helpful is a kind of photo guidance and imagery guidelines for civic tech. Um, because I think in the past I've seen some really fantastic guides around, you know, capturing images with smartphones and so on, but actually some kind of creative ideas about what photos you could use if you are on projects could be a really fantastic companion uh, to a kind of library of images to help organisations gather their own content, even if it is with kind of smartphones and without professional photographers. Excellent, thank you. And Daniel? Very quick. Uh, beyond photo libraries, especially, not the, it's not necessary to create something new. We have a, a bunch of shared resources already that we already use. Wikimedia Commons, Font Awesome uh, is uh, one of the most used icon libraries in the world. And maybe, you know, the community can spend $10,000, that is the, the amount they charge for a new icon, and have an open data icon that is like everywhere. Um, the Now Project, there's a bunch of places where people already are looking for materials. And I think that's where we need to go first. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm going to start bringing us to a close now and hopefully you can see uh, a slide on the screen which gives you a sense of what's gonna happen next. Can everybody see a big thing which says Action Lab 4? Yes. Excellent, thank you. So, um, thank you all for a really useful discussion uh, today. Uh, this will end up going somewhere, which is, uh, after this event, uh, there will be an action lab, uh, aka a working group, that will convene. Um, there'll be around six people uh, on that. They will work together, looking back at what we discussed today, what's on the Padlet, what's in the chat, what's in the, in the discussion, um, to commission some work to help address some of the challenges that we've raised. Um, anyone can apply to join that action lab, so please do sign up to the Tech Tech mailing list. Uh, you'll find a link on the website and possibly in the chat as well. Um, so you'll find out when uh, the applications are open, do apply, and then uh, they will make the funding available uh, through a call for proposals uh, to, to get somebody to do some work, which will help, hopefully solve some of the problems that we talked about today. Not all of them, because uh, there, there are a lot, um, as we've been discussing, but um, hopefully we'll be able to get a really practical solution uh, that will help civic tech across the world uh, based on what we discussed today. So all that remains uh, for me to say, um, huge thank you to our brilliant speakers. 
a huge thank you to all of you in the audience uh, for coming as long some really useful contributions in the chat and on the padlet as well um, and a big thank you to the national endowment for democracy for funding this work as well uh, we'll be back in a couple of months for the next uh, global civic tech surgery uh, in the meantime keep an eye out for um that uh opening of the Action Lab applications, and also keep an eye out for call, the calls for proposals around accessibility and inclusivity in civic tech and access and quality information for civic tech success as well. So um, yes, do sign up to the mailing list. Hopefully see you again in a couple of months for the next uh, civic tech surgery, if not before. And uh, thank you very much again. Enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you. <laughs>